It's our tradition towards the end of the academic year uh, annually to do a review of our residency training program. And our, of course, our program is really foundational to the department and all that we do. It's also my privilege today to reintroduce you to John Andrilli, who's the Internal Medicine Residency Program Director and is also an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Andrilli joined us not too long ago and his career is as follows. He completed an accelerated six-year undergraduate and uh, medical degree program at Penn State and then Jefferson College of Medicine, also completing his residency at Jefferson College and staying on even longer as to start his career in internal medicine, particularly primary care at Jefferson, before coming to New York City and St. Vincent's Hospital and Medical Center um, to take up a career there in general medicine. And I think as you look through John's CV, he's one of these people that gets recognized very early as being talented, and particularly a talented communicator. He rose up quickly through the ranks at St. Vincent, ultimately becoming the division chief for internal medicine and geriatrics before moving to Beth Israel, where he had that title as well. Um, you know, all of us come to medicine for different reasons, but I think essential to many of us is this sense of a calling to having this idea that there's something greater than us that we're turning towards and in doing so that we really are fulfilling something that will both bring and give something to the world but also bring fulfillment and meaning to our lives and looking through John's CV a clear strain throughout his career has been his passion for education for working with students and trainees and colleagues and advancing our profession and so when I met John uh, now a couple summers ago to talk about this role, I was struck by something. He's heard, he's heard me say this several times. We were sitting over breakfast. And I was trying to get the measure of the man. And I said, why are you interested in this role? And he said, well, you know, education has always really been fundamental to me. And I've always wanted to be a program director. And so it's been a delight for us to have John with us in our program. He's done wonderful things, even in his short time with us. And really anxious to hear his review today. Thank you, Samuel. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the state of the residency, and you know I'll preface it by saying, you know, a lot of the things that happened that you're going to see were really in place even before I came, and it's really the group of APDs here in the front and Dr. Prigolini. Uh, and even the previous program director, Dr. Patel, and really Dr. Sword, because he took a lot of lead in a lot of the changes that were going on. Um, and then, so this is our program office now. And also, so I'll tell you, when I came on board, the people at the bottom, there was no one except Linda Critchlow, because the entire program office had left. So we've slowly been building up the program office. We have a new program administrator who I don't see, but she will be coming, Lillian. And then we have Tanya, Trisha, and then Linda Critchlow has been a longtime person up at St. Luke's. And so I, I will say once I came on, I thought, what did I take on? Because this was our notification letter when I first came on. Um, we had four extended citations. We had nine or five new citations. And we were continued accreditation with a warning and this ominous statement at the bottom at the, at the time of the next review, the program status will be in jeopardy if these areas have not been addressed satisfactorily. Or an, and or other major areas of warning, warrant, warranting citation develop. But over the course of the next few months, because I had to put the program update in, I found out all the work that had been going on over the last two years. So just to kind of uh, orient you here, the way these slides are set up is up here, this is the residency review committee requirement that we have to meet. This is from our most recent survey last spring. And essentially, this will give you three years running of what the residents have said about our program. And what you don't want to see, so our line is the blue, the orangish color is the national mean. You do not want to see anything below the mean, and you also don't want to see downward trends because you're not improving. So this was the first one. I think everyone's aware of this, about our clinical records that document both inpatient and amateur care must be readily available at all times. This was before we had electronic records that kind of communicated. So a lot of work has been done for that. We began with read-only access to EPIC in March of 2017. There's also the Community Gateway Portal that now lets our residents at uh, the Ryan Center see the labs and other studies from the hospital and vice versa. 
And then as many of you probably know, we started our Epic implementation uh, for ambulatory in October of 2017, and we just went through our inpatient uh, implementation in March of 2018. So I now think we've addressed this issue. There's lots of rumblings about Epic, you know, but I think that's just the growing pain. So I think we've really kind of met this challenge. And here we have service to education and balance. The learning objectives of the program must not be compromised by excessive reliance on residents to fulfill non-physician service obligations. Uh, and so the way this was addressed is there are monthly calls with leadership, including the DIO, the CMOs, and the CNOs. And the biggest one that relieved a lot of the work of the house staff was taking all most routine phlebotomy tasks away from the house staff and turning that over to the nurses. And then there's a bunch of other things that we addressed over time, or that were addressed over time. Uh, responsibilities of faculty. The faculty must devote sufficient time to the educational program to fulfill their supervisory and teaching responsibilities and to demonstrate a strong interest in education of the residents. And you can see we've been slowly improving here. Um, and this is because the number of core faculty at each institution uh, was doubled and is now at near target levels. And there were multiple faculty developments that were held in 2016 and 2017. Uh, including those on completing resident evaluations, providing effective resident feedback, and for bedside teaching. And I will make a comment. So these, these system level GME days, this is something that happens every fall. And Samuel has been very generous in letting a lot of the faculty take that day off so they can go to this system wide GME day. And our next one is coming up in November. Duty hours and working environment. I think everyone's aware that the life has changed a lot from when many of us has changed and the resident hours are very closely monitored. Uh, and at the time, we were violating uh, letting them not work more than 80 hours per week and also uh, giving them. So the, AC, the ACGME says you have to give them at least one day off in seven, but that can be averaged over a month. We actually follow a much more stringent rule, which is the New York State rule, which means they have to have a 24 hour period off every seven days. And so uh, I will say since July of this year, we've not had a single duty hour violation in the three times that we've had to report. So I think we've successfully addressed this issue. Um, service education and balance. Again, this comes up again. Resident service responsibilities must be limited to patients for whom the teaching service has diagnostic and therapeutic responsibility. Teaching service is defined as those patients for whom internal medicine residents routinely provide care. And really the one they're looking for is down here. Do you routinely provide care for patients on the non-teaching service? 7.9%, which is actually not a bad number. I looked back at our uh, survey from last year, and that was 25%. And so a lot of the things that were done to fix that, obviously, were uh, the Division of Hospital Medicine assumed the care of most private patients, both at Mount Sinai St. Luke's and Mount Sinai West, uh, on the services known as ADS, which are the attending directed services. Uh, the second one is in flux right now, so we created something called the MAPA at West, which was uh, taking the triaging role of the residents during daytime away from the house staff. Uh, and it was put in a P the PA's hands. We've had to roll back on that currently due to staffing issues with the hope of maybe bringing that back again in the future. Uh, and then uh, a physician-assisted directed service for post-cath patients is planned and targeted for July of 2018 because I think the, the cardiology services, especially at St. Luke's, is one of our areas of risk because more than 50% of the patients that the residents see stay less than 24 hours, and oftentimes they don't even have a chance to round with the attending because they're discharged before the attending even rounds. And so that's really kind of a uh, limited educational value for the residents. Evaluation of residents. This is one that we're always struggling with. So the faculty must evaluate residents' performance in a timely manner during each rotation or similar educational assignment and document this evaluation at the completion of the assignment. Um, this is, again, one of those where you don't want to see that downward trend, but we are uh, heading up. Uh, several things were done about this. So there was a program coordinator specifically brought on to manage uh, this beast called New Innovations, which includes all the evaluations, but it's very labor intensive. That initial person did not work out and she was let go. Uh, but now we have two new coordinators, one of whom's focus is to kind of fix all of the new evaluations uh, process. So hopefully, I know a lot of you haven't been getting the evaluations on a regular basis, but we're actually actively rebuilding the system as we speak. So you should start seeing a lot of evaluations very shortly. Um, and then Dr. Goldberg implemented an outpatient process where uh, there were collaborative faculty evaluations. 
we thought this was important because you know it, when you're in your outpatient clinic you may only work with one preceptor one or two times a week over your two-week block and then you're working with a bunch of other preceptors so we didn't think it was really fair for that one preceptor to put evaluation in so the preceptors meet on an ongoing basis as a group discuss the candidates and then one person will put in that representative evaluation and we're hoping to do a similar process on the inpatient floors especially as we move to this kind of system of having the hospitals be one week on one week off because one week is not really a good amount of time or adequate amount of time to fully assess a resident so our plan is to create some dyad pairs so the hospitalist will work for a month two hospitalists with the team and they'll kind of communicate over the month and put in an evaluation together at the end of the month that also allows kind of uh, time to give some feedback to the resident and then see if they're really improving over the course of the month and then there's a bunch of faculty development sessions as well on trainee development uh, resources again uh, sponsoring institution and ACG made credit programs must provide a learning and working environment in which residents fellows have the opportunity to raise concerns and provide feedback without intimidation or retaliation in a confidential manner as appropriate I don't think we ever retaliated against anyone but they didn't necessarily feel like they had the best ways to um, have their voice heard uh, so a lot of things were done to address this the complement of APDs was increased from three to five they doubled the size of the pool with faculty advisors. Um, there was, again, some faculty development about how to check in about wellness issues. And finally, you know, Dr. Swords started a House Staff Council in 2014, which meets monthly with the program leadership and Dr. Sword. And I think he would agree it's a very vocal council where they bring very active issues to us on a regular basis. And many of you have been invited to sit and address the council at times, too, we which I know. <laughs> exactly. Some which is, you know, some of the things they bring are things we can fix and other things we just have to tell them right now that's just the way things are. Uh, and then here we go, uh, here's another use resident feedback towards program improvement. So really there's been tons of things that have been done from the House Staff Council to improve things. A lot of these I've already addressed, but creating the private PA teams, expansion of the number of faculty, expansion of the APDs, the House Staff Council, taking away phlebotomy, uh, improving the educational experience of morning reports, noon conferences. Uh, they now get paid and protected uh, board review courses for everybody. Uh, and we initiated support for research and QI. And so this is how our residents rated us overall at our last survey. Our current one is being answered as we speak. But 63% were very positive about the program. 29% were positive. And you can see here we're above the national mean. So we're always happy if we're above the national mean. And you can see all of our measures for duty hours, faculty evaluation, educational content, resource, and patient safety teamwork, Dr. Rosenberg, are all on an upswing. And this is how our faculty uh, evaluated us. Invariably, the faculty always evaluate the program better than the residents do, and that's something that happens everywhere. So 71% of our faculty were very positive. Interesting enough, we're a little bit below the mean there. 21% um, were positive, and then also, again, we're on an upward trend after last year. So this is the most important thing. If I gave this talk a week ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this, but I just got our notification letter at 519 last Friday. We are now a program without a warning. We're fully accredited, and we have no citations. They were all resolved. And I'll let you know, so what they said, the review committee commended the program for its demonstrated substantial compliance with the program requirements without any new citations. The committee commends the program on swift resolution of all previous areas of non-compliance and its many related recent accomplishments, notably the implementation of the new EMR and the improvements with duty hour adherence. The committee looks forward to reviewing continued positive outcomes. And again, I will say I had very little to do with this except enter a lot of information in. You know, I was almost a little bit uh, sad that they all went away because now I feel like we can only go down. But still, this was a fantastic accomplishment. So, John told his father. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to show you what our, our resident scholarly activity. Uh, you know, they are a very productive group of residents. Um, you can see over here, 100% do a teaching presentation, which is an hour-long presentation to the entire house staff. And then many, many, many of them are doing kind of uh, research, 33% uh, of them had 
uh, PubMed citations, 62% went to conferences, which Dr. Sword supports uh, financially to a great extent. And then this is our, our faculty scholar activity also, very impressive productivity, which we want to continue. So this is our board uh, pass rate. So this is our rolling pass rate over each three-year period. You can see if we look back a few years ago, we were only at 77%. Uh, and then we've been slowly increasing. So our three-year pass rolling pass rate right now is 90%. And this is what our residents did last year. So we're actually better than the mean. We had a 95% board pass rate. So we were very happy with that. Uh, our graduating residents are all growing on to fantastic programs. I think everyone should have gotten the email to show where everyone was going uh, for either their fellowship or their work, but this is the list. I will highlight our chiefs, some of whom are in the room. Ashish is staying with us for cardiology at Mount Sinai and St. Luke's. Uh, Sid is going on to Hemonk at the Cleveland Clinic. Lindsay is going to Northwestern, who I think is uptown for infectious disease. And Rodrigo, who is enjoying himself somewhere in Norway or Sweden or somewhere, uh, he's going to Los Angeles for pulmonary critical care. We have a huge amount of people going into general internal medicine, which I'm very pleased to see. Uh, Jasmine, who's gonna, who just took a position at NYU Winthrop, will be staying in the area. And then I also would like to point out that we have two of our residents going into primary care, staying with us in the system. We have many people staying with us for hospitalists, um, but we have Debbie Goodman, who's going to join Mount Sinai uh, doctor's faculty practice. And I'm focusing on this because I'm a primary care doctor. So my goal is to try and get more people to do primary care. And then we have Devora, who's going to be staying with us as one of our teaching preceptors at the Ryan Centers. So we're very excited to keep them on board. So here's our match results. So we had, thought we had a very successful match. These are our categorical statistics. You know, this is the, the most important number is how far do you go down in your list? So uh, we typically would go down, or last year we went down to 181. This year we actually only went down to 159. We actually got our first choice, and the match index is how many people do you need to rank to fill your program? And we've seen over the course of the last four years a continued improvement in our match index. You know, the preliminary numbers are about stayed stable. I think you'll see when you see our preliminaries, though, they come mostly from the North Seas and schools that I think you'll all recognize. I'm not going to go through the entire list because you should have also had that all emailed to you, but this is our categorical list. And so this was our first year to have a successful match for the primary care track. And so we got four excellent residents in a new track, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that from Dr. Goldberg. Um, but our match index is a pretty good index of 4.5. Many other programs in the system are at 5, 6, and 7. So we actually have one of the best match indexes of the programs. And this is our preliminary match list. And again, most of the people come from the Northeast schools. We draw from this whole area. We have one person from Texas I saw. OK, now we're going to switch uptown and have Dr. Prigolini give you some uh, uh, information about milestones and EPAs. So we have to switch the slides. And Allie, are you up there? OK. I know, I tried to make it an obvious slide. <laughs> the big arrow. So it's competent to practice medicine. And 
the question is how do we know that that's going to work? Uh, where do we get our information from? Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, where we like set the model for you know how uh, people get to become competent. So the idea is that we get all our internal user responses and we kind of like a school. And that there is with sufficient instruction time, practice and experience, they are acquiring skills that allows them to move into advanced beginners and competent provision and populate experts in this case. What we need to make sure is that people are competent, and that's what our patients actually need. So what is competency made of? And this is another well-accepted model for competency. Uh, it might look, I mean, it does have many layers, but the idea is that in order to become competent, you need to have knowledge. Uh, one thing is to, you know, in the beginning, you need to learn what is a CBC. And then, if you order a CBC and you get a result, you, know, to, you need to know how to interpret it and what to do with those results. And those first two uh, steps on this pyramid are related to cognition. Here on the left side, we also have ways to assess each one of these layers. Then at some point, you have to show that you know and you know how. And we do that, for example, our admissions go to the motion center, which is uh, a standardized patient experience or the same thing in the same lab, where people show uh, what they know. But then most in residency, we are here at the tip of the pyramid, uh, on the two. We learn by doing, by providing service. And we do this under supervision. That's the whole idea of residency. And the question is then, how do we know that people are advancing you know, in the right direction? And here again, we have the two main tools that we have to assess. Uh, if people are progressing. The first one is through direct observation. And the second one is with what's called here workplace-based assessments, which is basically the evaluations that the company was showing uh, in the previous slides. The direct observation is a whole other conference. I'm not going to focus on that today. I'm going to focus more on uh, evaluations. So I think for most of us in this room, we trained with evaluations that had some format you know, that's depicted here, where, uh, you know, you would rate uh, residents whether they were either satisfactory, low or above, or had expectation or different, you know, uh, uh, constructs. Uh, the result of doing this type of evaluation is that it is average to be superior. I mean, if you're below superior, people feel hurt, uh, and it's not very really useful to discriminate. Uh, uh, where people stand. Uh, with this type of evaluation, there are some evaluators who are very lenient, there are some evaluators who are very strict. Uh, throughout my training, I always said, well, but in the end, it levels up and we have a good average, uh, and maybe you do. Uh, but what I can say is that it's not very helpful to have this type of evaluation. So, in terms of then, defining what it means to be competent, it was around 2000-2001 when uh, ACGME actually, together with IPAN, defined the six main areas of competency that we need to assess. And that's interpersonal communication skills, medical knowledge, patient care, practice-based learning improvement, professionalism, and system-based practice. And then it took another 12-13 years uh, to define what we call the milestones, uh, this is part of what's called the new accreditation system, where within each one of these competencies, we need to uh, look at different milestones. And I'll give just an example here, for example, in patient care, the first milestone is to see whether a person is able to gather and synthesize essential and accurate information to define each patient's clinical problem. And you have, you know, 22 of these milestones that we look for. There are many more milestones, there are 140 nine milestones, but these are the ones that twice a year we need to create a report on each person in the program. So the way we report those milestones is like, you know, like, uh, like you see here on the slide, where instead of having a scale of one to nine, you have five different columns, which represent different levels of uh, skills that the, the, the training may or may not have achieved. 
And what the NP2 understands, there are you know, narratives rather than numbers. And for this, we have a committee. Many of you are part of those committees uh, where we review all the information that we have. And then we have to choose here at the bottom in green where people stand. And we have a choice to either put them on one column or between the columns. We can highlight a certain narrative. Uh, and then within these three columns, you have you know, somebody who has difficulty and is unable to do something, to somebody who usually does it, to somebody who does it consistently. And then here, it means that this person doesn't need any more supervision. This person can do this without us without us checking on them. So how do we get to here? And basically, this is an example, just one question out of the current evaluations that we have on innovations. And this is for an intern on a general medicine award. The first question is, uh, this person is able to acquire accurate and relevant history from the patient in an efficiently customized prioritized and hypothesis fashion. And that, they will say that this should be accomplished by the six months of age. And then people can choose, you know, between these four options, which means that if we go back to the previous slide, here we have five. So whenever somebody exceeds, it's up to the committee to define whether they are at the attending level or whether they are aspiration. In any case, what I want to point out is that with this system, uh, there are many reasons why it may not work out the way we'd like it to work. Uh, but once again, we have interns who are at attending level from the beginning. And that's the way, that's the norm, that's what we get most of the time. The idea of this type of evaluation is that during each rotation, each faculty member who works with the trainee is able to provide you know, information on certain aspects of training, and that we look at a certain, I would say, group of bricks on a wall, and that hopefully after getting many evaluations, we can infer the presence of a solid wall, or what's called the windows to competence. That's what we sign when our graduates come to the So, some people were not happy with this approach, which is the traditional approach that's used in most programs throughout the country. And then they came up with the idea of a different approach, which is an infrastructure professional attendance. Uh, the creator is uh, uh, an educator uh, in the Netherlands, Solid uh, and he defined you know, EPAs, infrastructure professional attendance, are things or responsibilities that can be trusted for me once they are competent enough to allow them to do that without somebody supervising. Uh, so his take on this is that we shouldn't be looking at bricks on the wall, we shouldn't be looking at knowledge communication in different rotations, uh, but we should define what we expect a doctor to do well and focus on that, and then infer the presence of competencies if we know that they are doing the routine as well. So for internal medicine, there have been 16 EPAs that have been defined. I won't read them out loud, but you know you can see that some of them are very rotation specific, maybe like four or five. Four we expect that to happen mostly in the clinics, five in the ICU, and some really happen throughout any rotation, like you know, one to three, you know, it can be on the floors, in the clinics, in the units. And there are some that I'm not sure that we are addressing properly uh, right now, like uh, facilitating a family meeting. I don't think we have a system now to know that every one of our residents is really competent at running a family meeting. And has patient safety. There's been a lot of improvement throughout the years, but I think there's still a lot of work to do on that area. So by focusing on this, uh, let me give you an example of what an evaluation form would look like. I'm not sure if you can read this, but this is an example from a program that was built based on EPAs, and this is for an intern on a general medicine ward rotation. And here what you have on the left is a list of activities that uh, they define that interns should know how to do this. So one of them is to start the policy insulin therapy and to manage blood sugar over time, to manage high blood pressure, to work up syncope, to choose antivirus for pneumonia, for cellulitis, and the list may go on. And then Instead of doing a list of one to nine or any other first list, let me show you on this next slide the rating scale. It's based on, on entrustment. Whether you as an attendant think how much supervision does this training need in order to do one, two, three, four, five. 
So this here goes from, you know, especially we just cannot do it, to they can do it with direct supervision, which usually means basically working with a resident, or with indirect supervision, meaning that there's an attendant that they're comfortable working with a resident, even without a resident. Or they can do this independently, they are the attending them, or the aspiration. Aspiration meaning it's a kind of person that you want to be kind of instructed. Uh, or maybe it's just in having a patient, I have a person I cannot address this. So, one of the good things about this is that we as faculty tend to agree much more when it comes to deciding how much supervision somebody needs than when we give a scale of function. So, there's less uh, variability among variables. Uh, what I describe as linear evaluators versus strict evaluators, that also evens out quite a bit. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's better. Uh, you need fewer evaluations to come up with a reliable assessment of whether they are not competent. And for the assessor, it's a much easier uh, evaluation form to fill out uh, than the traditional ones that we use. So the other thing that I particularly like about EPA is that for the first time, you know, the way they were defined were not, was not just by doctors in a room deciding what doctors should look like, but this included doctors, educators, and patients. So these are patients telling us what they expect from us. So if we want to move our program to an EPA-based program, I think it's a lot of work to do, but I think it's a very interesting and exciting work. Uh, so we need to put back our medical education committee, which we haven't had in a while with members from each divisional department. Uh, I'd like to have personal participation and then create a list of what is, you know, what a resident is expected to do during each rotation and then see how, uh, you know, the attendants working with those residents can really assess uh, how much supervision the person needs to put the task by the resident. And my impression is that if we build a program based on EPAs, you know, that can really science this person's content and we will have much more reliable data to support that statement. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. We're now going to have Dr. Goldberg come up and give us some information about the primary care track and primary care. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Angeli. Thank you, Dr. Pergolini. I'm going to talk this morning about our ambulatory curriculum as well as the primary care track. Um, I'm going to briefly just discuss our current curriculum and then talk about future directions. So our current curriculum, we are on a 6 plus 2 schedule, and for those who aren't familiar, the 2 refers to a 2-week ambulatory rotation every 6 weeks. And during that 2-week ambulatory block, our residents are engaged in a variety of activities. Primarily, they are focused on their continuity clinic, which takes place at one of three um, Ryan Community Health Network sites. These are federally qualified health centers. And they are, each of the site has their own faculty lead. Uh, Dr. Gita Varghese recently joined us as the site director at Ryan Chelsea. Dr. Deepal Patel is at William F. Ryan on 97th Street. And Dr. Ranjan Ginde is at the Thelma Adara Clinic in Harlem. In addition to their continuity clinics, they are engaged in outpatient subspecialty clinics that many of you are involved with. And then we have an academic half day weekly where they focus on core content of ambulatory um, sort of the bread and butter of ambulatory medicine, um, as well as their evidence-based medicine and wellness curriculum. And we additionally have a half day once per block focused on what we call art and practice sessions. And these are really physician communication skills sessions. And finally, we have a robust resident-driven experiential quality improvement curriculum. And I'm pleased to announce that residents at all three of our sites this year joined forces in designing and implementing a PPI de-escalation project, and were actually um, chosen as one of the top 20 abstracts nationally by the American College of Physicians. So where is ambulatory care training headed? We have compelling evidence over the last 20 years that the medical care we provide contributes only a fraction to preventive health outcomes, and that the real driver behind preventive health, health outcomes are social determinants, things like socioeconomic status, um, English proficiency, et cetera. 
recognizing this, there was a recent manifesto of sorts that was published in academic medicine by Jennifer Siegel and folks at BU that really calls and urges graduate medical education programs to focus as part of their formal curriculum on social determinants of health and health disparities. And this has been um, supported by the Clinical Learning Environment Review, which is a ACGMA program focused on providing feedback to healthcare environments that train our residents and fellows um, as to how to deliver quality um, and safe patient care. And in their national report in 2000, of findings in 2016, stated clinical learning environments need to ensure that the residents and fellows learn to recognize healthcare disparities and strive for optimal outcomes for all patients, especially those in potentially vulnerable populations. So I think in ambulatory care, we're heading to a point where we need to prepare our trainees to be upstreamists. This was a term by Dr. Manchata. Um, and that is, how do you recognize what's getting someone sick in the first place? How do you identify a patient's unmet needs? And furthermore, how, how do you mitigate these needs? So with that, our ambulatory curriculum for the next academic year, um, we decided to focus our arts and practice curriculum um, on equitable patient-centered care. And this will be targeted to our PGY1s. And I should mention, this is part of a larger institutional initiative um, under the lead of Dr. Maria Maldonado to really incorporate social determinants and health disparities um, for all of our internal medicine programs across the board. We are also going to be focusing our empanelment data for residents, um, not just on provider panels, which can be challenging with a six plus two system, but really in terms of practice groups. So our residents are now organized into groups of four and take care of a panel of patients. And importantly, we want that data and feedback to come back to the residents in a stratified manner such that they're receiving demographic data and understanding more specifically what are the healthcare disparities in amongst my own patient population. We'll also be having supplemental practical skills sessions, and these will be things such as um, if the residents are having a core topic talk on diabetes management, we will have the clinical diabetic educators from the clinic come and talk to them about the practicalities of insulin management, um, a talk that went over very well this year. Uh, our QI leaders will be targeting PGY1s in the second half of their year and PGY2s in the beginning of their year um, to really take the lead on these projects. And then we're going to broaden some of our core topics to include things like health policy, business of medicine, and high value care content. Um, as many of you may or may not know, this was our inaugural year for the primary care track here. And this was a track started obviously to address the physician shortage in primary care, but also to nurture the professional development of residents who are interested in pursuing primary care. Um, we obviously do very well in our fellowship match, and we are a program that very much supports training of primary care physicians. Uh, this table I put up, this is from a, a study in, in JAMA in 2012, and the results here are based on ITE survey results from PGY3 residents. And the number I circled here is to show that less than 40% of PGY3s in primary care programs chose to pursue a career in primary care. So primary care tracks and programs in and of themselves are, are insufficient to address this shortage. We have to be asking what are programs who are retaining residents in primary care, what are they doing right? And so our program chose to focus on three aspects or components of um, that, that we felt contributed to career choice and has been supported in the literature. One is longitudinal engagement with the curriculum over a three-year period. The second is mentorship and having faculty mentorship throughout that period. And the third is really to expose them to a wide variety of topics that aren't covered in their ambulatory curriculum to help them feel more comfortable. I'm always struck by how our residents seem very adept at knowing when a patient needs BiPAP, but freeze when their family member calls them and says, I hurt my shoulder, what do I do? And we want to change that. Our primary care track is completely integrated into the uh, categorical program, but they have increased elective time dedicated to primary care activities. This is um, our current uh, five residents who are in the track, um, and this is them engaging with um, Dr. Ali for a joint injection session in the sim lab. And they engage in a variety of activities that I'm not going to speak about in detail now, but I'm happy to talk to anybody about another time. 
In 2017, 2018, which was our first year, we had an internal recruitment of residents and have a total of five residents. And I'm pleased to announce that all three of our PGY3s um, will be going into, into primary care. And Dr. Andrilli mentioned two of them. Um, Debbie Goodman will be going uh, joining a practice on the east side, uh, Mount Sinai practice as a practitioner, and then Deborah Edelman will be joining us as a clinician educator. Um, and Heather uh, Viola will be staying on as a chief resident. We also have a PGY1 in the program and one PGY2. We had a successful um, match this year, which we are thrilled about. So all four of our PGY1 slots for the track were filled. And our hope is that in the next academic year, we will recruit four more so effectively doubling the size of our program as it currently exists. This was a self-assessment. Um, the bottom represents each of the five residents and a self-assessment pre-curriculum this year and post-curriculum. And all of our residents improved in their knowledge and confidence across a variety of content areas related to primary care. Thanks to the support of Dr. Stewart, our chair, um, Dr. Burke, our division chief, senior hospital leadership in our program, we are proud to be the recipients of the Department of Health, uh, the New York State Department of Health Doctors Across New York Ambulatory Training Grant. This grant is a multi-year grant and will allow our primary care track residents to become experts in taking care of the vulnerable patient population they see in the West Harlem community around their Thelma Adair clinic site. Through this grant, our residents will engage in a very immersive um, um, experiential and classroom-based curriculum where they will learn to form community partnerships, understand the role of addiction medicine, behavioral health integration, home visits, um, and community-based organization partnerships in learning to take care of patients beyond the exam room. Uh, we, they will also be required to engage in a longitudinal project that is focused on one aspect of uh, community health as it relates to their patient population. We were also chosen as one of 10 primary care programs in the state by the Greater New York Hospital Association to participate in an immersion training program that partners primary care residency programs with a community-based organization. And we are pleased to be matched with City Health Works that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, our first resident actually just completed training with them and is planning on conducting a longitudinal project uh, with them. So we're very excited about this. Uh, we obviously want to continue to optimize our relationship with Ryan um, and sort of align our two missions together. And then finally, optimizing our partnerships with other departments and within our system and even within our own department. Many of you have been involved with residents in our track. I see Dr. Greisman, um, and I thank you for that. And those of you who are here who may have set the groundwork for this track in the first place, um, we would always love to have people who are, want to mentor residents interested in primary care. And I would certainly love to hear ideas that anybody has going forward. So please reach out if interested. And with that, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Biro, who's going to talk about uh, wellness. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. Good morning. Um, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart as a product of the residency program here at Mount Sinai St. Luke's Roosevelt. Um, I think, you know, I can remember from first days as a resident being reminded by our program directors how important it was to take care of yourself before you could take proper care of your patients. Um, of course, this is easier said than done, um, as we've all experienced throughout our profession. Um, and it's something I personally struggle with still to this day and probably why I'm so passionate about um, trying to help and facilitate this in our residents, especially as the landscape of medicine and, and um, care delivery changes so much over the years or has changed. One thing that um, I'm heartened by is um, the ACG uh, really has a strong commitment towards physician well-being, specifically in trainees, um, residents, fellows, but as well uh, faculty. Um, it's important to remember um, and is underscored repeatedly in programs that self-care is actually a very important component of professionalism. Um, because without being well yourself, how can you take the best care of your patients, of course? Um, and it's our responsibility as programs, as well as um, in partnership with our institutions, um, that we focus on this and 
um, give it the same priority that we give uh, mastering other competencies in residency education. Um, something, uh, a new development in the last year um, are some very particular revisions in the ACGME common program requirements which address very particularly um, training well-being, um, specifically in the learning and working environment um, that they are, they are in. Um, so in, in addition to excellence in patient safety, quality of care, and professionalism, um, the commitment to well-being of students, residents, faculty members, and members of the entire healthcare team um, has been of a particular focus. And just to expand on that further, um, ACGME fortunately has provided a lot of resources and a lot of direction on ways that we can address these things, which many programs um, for many years have tried to do already, um, but just to emphasize um, you know, in addition to balancing scheduling, work intensity, um, making sure policies and programs are in place um, to support residents so that they can attend uh, to their own or tend to their own um, well-being, um, as well as identifying symptoms of burnout in themselves as well as their colleagues and knowing what to do when they recognize that um, and who to go to and what resources are available. Um, going back to point A, um, a curriculum that we started a few years ago focused a lot on um, developing more meaning and finding more meaning in what we do in the day to day, our day to day work. Um, and that can be approached from two different perspectives, both personal as well as systematic. Um, systematic obviously is a much larger um, beast to tackle, and we're all invested in that. Um, but on a personal level, in the meantime, as systematic things are changing, we um, have really strove to uh, introduce ways that we can um, provide tools to our residents to um, cope within the, the system that we are working in um, and find the meaning in what, in what we do, despite all the challenges and the bombardment of technology and, and other just similar distractions. Um, so just to go back a little bit before the ACGME requirements um, emphasized this, um, we have been very fortunate to be part of a program, as I said, that always emphasized taking care of yourself before you can take care of others. Um, and I think one of the biggest parts of, of that, and is one of the main reasons why I've stayed so long at St. Luke's Roosevelt, is the community that we have here and looking out in the audience, um, both here at West and Uptown, um, the mentors that are still here with us um, that were mentors to me and provided a supportive environment for us to um, fulfill our potential is one of the things I'm most proud about um, being part of this community. Um, and that continues. Um, Dr. Gandhi, Vani Gandhi, as most of you know, um, has been dedicated for decades to resident wellness. Um, from integrative medicine uh, didactics, to mindfulness and stress reduction techniques um, through meditation, um, and this goes back many years. So she's really a foremother of, of wellness in our community. Um, with her help, as well as a few other like-minded individuals, um, and some passionate uh, ideas from one of our past residents, Krishna Chokshi, we came together in 2015 and, and formalized the curriculum. Um, and with the support of Dr. Goldberg, uh, we carved out time within the the curriculum um, and it was during our ambulatory curriculum that we were reserved so to speak an, an hour every week for our residents um, to uh, so that we can prioritize uh, resident well-being and it wouldn't be something that was added on to um, their already taxing schedules um, and it at that time we had it really relied on three pillars um, one was something that was created by Krishna Chokshi which uh, relied on using literature and writing exercises to reflect on the experiences that we all face on a day-to-day -day, um, day -day basis as, as physicians, especially physicians in training. Um, and Dr. Gandhi and Shelly Latte, who was formerly with us, um, who were both trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction, conducted voluntarily um, numerous sessions for our residents. Um, starting in July 1st, we, we were fortunate that we had that groundwork, um, but after the ACGME mandate to 
um, really ensure that programs are, are um, expanding upon this. We were very fortunate to partner with Mount Sinai, who had also been doing their own work for many years. Um, so, you know, with the support and collaboration of Jonathan Ripp, um, we extended and sort of standardized our curriculum throughout the three hospitals, um, Mount Sinai Main Hospital, Beth Israel, and ourselves, um, focusing on two elements that really um, we have the most evidence for in supporting, preventing, um, and treating burnout in physicians in training, and those are mindfulness and reflection. So that became our core structure. Um, the, one of the beautiful things about this system-wide initiative is we had a lot more support in many ways um, to um, make it a more regular and consistent part of the curriculum. So we had four, um, and have had this year, four trained facilitators, including our own Bonnie Gandhi, Patricia Bloom, Mickey Brown, and Archimedes Bibiano, who each took a group of residents and have followed them through the years, through the year, focusing on the first years. So the curriculum is called Mindfulness for Interns, and um, all the interns are exposed to the same um, topics over five or six sessions um, across the academic year. And that's consistent across all three sites. Um, with our reflection sessions, which focus on the PGY twos and threes, um, each site has a little bit more flexibility and, and freedom to be creative. Um, all based on, all the sessions are based generally on some type of facilitated discussion. Um, here at Mount Sinai St. Luke's West, we spent the first half of the academic year using fine arts as a medium for reflection. Um, and we were very fortunate to have the support to work with um, the director of the Art Med Insight Program over at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and of course, it, it's traditionally um, focuses on enhancing perception and observe, observation in medicine, specifically for physical diagnosis courses um, and medical students. Um, Anna Will Yam worked with us very closely to tailor something unique to our residents, knowing what our overarching goal was um, regarding having a, um, an area, a safe place to reflect on the experiences that residents are going through. Um, so we, our first session was conducted at the Metropolitan, which was a great um, retreat for the residents. And then the second session, we had the facilitators come to us in our conference room, made it a little bit easier for them. So they had two different um, sessions during that first half of the year. Um, the second half of the year, we focused more on facilitated discussion, but each group had, again, their own flavor. Um, Krishna Chokshi, although she graduated and is now at um, Sloan as a chief resident, she continues to facilitate groups for us with her unique creation of reflection rounds. Um, Alex Macy, a master's in narrative medicine, um, has committed herself to um, assisting us in this as well and has taken two groups. Um, and additionally, our, our team grows, our family grows uh, of, of passionate um, attendings. Um, two of our hospitalists, Amika Budev and Nadia Pantsulaya, have been very enthusiastic in joining forces and creating their own unique variation on facilitated discussion and focusing on positive psychology and, and even using things like activities and games to, to be able to, um, <laughs> to be able to um, focus on certain themes like hope and resilience. Um, additionally, new continued and future developments, um, we're very fortunate now to have Iman Shan um, in pulmonary critical care as our Department of Medicine wellness champion. Um, and she is already contributing greatly in, in really unifying a lot of the efforts. Um, um, has added humanism and ethics lectures, um, discussion, into, um, engaged dis discussions, as well as getting a regular weekly yoga session established for our residents. Um, and we have two wellness resident representatives as well um, who have taken an active part um, in, in developing the program further. Um, Vani continues to do her work. Um, we've collaborated with our chaplain, Meredith Lisagor, and new ideas on the horizon for that. Um, and to address the systematic um, point of view, and I'll, I'll just end on this, um, the, uh, and this is an another heartening thing for us all to see, is that our institution, GME, in com combination with the Department of Medicine, 
um, recognizes and supports efforts and initiatives in, in addressing the systematic factors that contribute to burnout, um, including clinical intensity, um, non-clerical work that the residents are, are often stricken with. Um, and so recently, uh, they ex uh, accepted applications from residents and fellows across the department um, proposing initiatives on ways to, novel ways to reduce that non-clerical work. Um, as a way to move towards move towards what we're all working for. Um, it's a work in progress, um, but it's something I think that we, although we may never perfect, it's something we have to continue working on, and we appreciate all of your support. So hi, so um, so Dr. Osei, so we're gonna so I'm gonna lead on the research and medical education that many of you guys have been great mentors and supported our residents throughout the three years that they're with us and even forward as fellows or as clinicians. So the medical education track, um, we have at this time seven of our residents, two who are current second years who are finishing up the track who started as first years, and then five second years who are gonna continue on as third years in the track. Uh, this is a system-wide track, so this is actually a collaboration of all three, BI, uh, West, St. Luke's, and uh, the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai uh, Residency Program, all together meeting. Um, they're selected after match, and actually our group the, this year, um, in a few months, is gonna get called for applications for anyone who's interested, so the current first years of any are interested in medical education track will be applying to be part of this track. Uh, it's a focus on adult learning theory, uh, clinical design, implementation, effective feedback and evaluation. They, they are given opportunities for teaching in both the, the residency, uh, but also with the medical student uh, courses at, at ICON. Uh, they are also expected to develop a two-year educational project with a mentor. Um, examples that we have right now ongoing is one is on bedside and patient teaching. Another curriculum is on critical appraisal um, critical appraisal, uh, critical appraisal, and uh, differential diagnosis. Um, sorry, clinical appraisal and differential diagnosis. And another one is on advanced breast cancer detection screening. So the directors are Dr. Thomas and Dr. Uh, Andrew Coyle over at Mount Sinai. Uh, so uh, grand round. So in a few months, in a few weeks, we're going to have our scholarly work for 2017, 2018, 2017, 2018 presented. Last year. At our grand rounds, we had a few of our uh, residents present some of their work. Um, so we have our best representation, again, through many of the mentors who are here present. Um, so last year, we had representation of our residents at 22 conferences. This is HA, this is ACA, this is a, uh, SGIM. Um, so 24 oral presentations, many who were award winners as um, junior investigators. Uh, 114 posters were presented, many who went on to publish these presentations, and many who were also involved in chapters uh, that were published. Um, what we're trying to implement now is provide more tools and resources. I, myself, and the preceptor for the evidence-based uh, medicine lectures that are provided during the didactic block that was mentioned by Dr. Goldberg, and evidence-based medicine lectures are more um, led by using the JAMA guidelines, and then we also have a resident-led journal club that's um, done that we have every like twice a month, basically. Um, and what we're trying to do is provide more tools and resources to have our uh, residents be able to really grow more in terms of clinical research. And one of the things that we started this year is the ability for them to register and to do this NIH clinical centers. Introduction to the Principles and Practice of Clinical Research course. So this is basically an online, self-paced um, course that's available. There are 49 lectures, they're about 30 to 120 minutes each. Um, and it provides basically basic biostats, epi methods involved conducting clinical research, provides you know, principles involved in just ethical and legal regulatory issues in clinical human subjects research, and also just the role of IRBs. Uh, principles and issues and just doing patient-oriented research and then just describing the infrastructure that you have to do in order to understand in order to perform clinical research and steps involved in developing funding research studies. Um, the nice thing about what, what's going to happen is that 
they can take a final exam before June 30th of 2018 and they'll receive a certificate of completion of this course. Um, that will, and at this time we have about one uh, quarter of our residents who are enrolled in this course from first to third years. Another tool that we're, uh, that you're going to be seeing soon is an innovation of using it, something called Trilo uh, website. So this is uh, used by many businesses and what it is is a collaboration, it allows for collaboration um, and when people are involved in multiple projects in different sites. And what's going to be is basically a board community. And this is basically a snapshot of the website that I'm already creating. Um, and what these different boards are is this will allow, uh, so this here would be where all the conferences for all different specialties will be listed. And what you can do is we're going to basically put the deadlines for the abstract submissions for each of these conferences. And so that the residents are going to be able to see what what conferences are available, but not just what conferences are available, but what what are the the deadlines for these abstracts, so that when their idea for a project is initiated, they know you know what is the goal in mind that they want to do, and when does that goal need to be met by. Other things that will be put in this to do uh, research resources would be things like what are the rules for authorship, uh, where are uh, journals that you know that people can submit to. Uh, what are the, the restrictions for those journals uh, for either online publication, do you have to pay or not, and even what are the guidelines for those journals in terms of publication. And for each class, uh, each person is going to uh, get a request to develop their own basically board that will be private only to them and to the program leadership. But also what we will be doing is that if uh, one intern is working with one attending, that attending will have access to that board so that they can also be following along with the, uh, with the resident in mind with that project. And this is kind of what the timeline is going to be looking at with that private board. So from conception of idea, what, what is your goal? Is it a journal or conference? Do you have an interesting case or concept for research? What is the proposal? You know, do you have to do an IRB? How are you going to collect the data? How are you analyzing the data? Are you drafting the manuscript? Where are you submitting? Has it been submitted? Does it need to be revised or is it being accepted? And we're going to get, we're allowed to be able to get a notification as this timeline is kind of progressing for each project. And so this is something that many of the faculty will be involved in just to kind of be able to see. And it'll, it'll basically provide a form framework for for not just the resident, but also for us as mentors to be able to kind of guide uh, the resident as they're getting the idea, but also to completion. And this will be an example of basically for each class, we would be getting these different boards for and each of these icons are basically a private board for that one resident. So we would have a private board for that one resident that would be attached to a faculty member and we would also have access as a program to be able to kind of be able to see what it is that's available that each person is doing but also be able to provide guidance while they're doing it. Um, and now I'm going to take it over to Dr. Andre. <laughs> thank you. So thank you everyone. In the interest of time because we want to leave some time for questions, I'm just going to shoot through these real quick. So some challenges we have is we have to get more of our training into the ambulatory space. A third of the residents' time has to be in ambulatory, and currently we're averaging 26 to 31 percent. I think Janet left, so I'm not going to give her a heart attack by showing this next slide. But we're also kind of way overweighted. I see Joe back there. We're way overweighted with critical care for our residents in their training, and we may need to balance that a little bit. Um, these are some other uh, challenges we have. Evaluation and feedback is ongoing. Lots of issues we have with that. I just want to show our uh, future chiefs. So this is our next group of chiefs that's going to be taking over. And then we have our chiefs for 2019 and 2020. And I'm also going to say Charles was just accept, uh, chosen to be one of the Sloan chiefs, which is fantastic. And then we'll end on this slide, which is our current chiefs and for all the work that they've done for us all the time. So thank you guys. And so if there's any questions, 